Good morning, everyone. As many of you know, we continue to see a rise in cases, which is concerning to all of us. Going from an average of 25 per day last week to 72 cases reported Wednesday, 109 reported Thursday, and 84 reported today. We're definitely moving in the wrong direction. While we've taken steps to slow the spread over the last few weeks, including an advisory to limit social gatherings and requiring quarantine for any out-of-state travel, cases continue to rise. I want to be clear. We're in a new phase of this pandemic. The days of very low risk are over. So unfortunately, I'm announcing several new measures to slow the spread so we can protect the vulnerable. These steps are data-driven, meaning they're targeted directly at the areas driving our current case growth. As we've seen recently, many of our clusters and outbreaks are tracing back to private social gatherings like baby showers, tailgate parties, deer camps, and other small gatherings like barbecues where multiple households are getting together and not wearing masks or staying physically separated for long periods of time. It's no coincidence that we're seeing these increases 12 days after we know many gathered for Halloween parties. And though we've been warning against these activities for weeks, they're still happening. Given our recent case growth, we have no choice but to restrict social gatherings, whether at a home, a bar, or in a parking lot after a game. So, starting today, multiple or multi-household gatherings, both inside and out, whether in public or private spaces, are prohibited. I know this is incredibly discouraging, especially because many of you have worked so hard and we've had much success for so long. But the fact is, people getting, getting together, not being careful, and letting their guard down is why we're in this position today. Our data shows these multi-household interactions are also taking place at bars and clubs. So effective tomorrow at 10 p.m., bars and social clubs will be closed to in-person service. Restaurants, however, can remain open, but are required to close in-person service at 10 p.m. each night though they will be able to offer to-go service after 10. To assist with contact tracing, which helps us prevent and contain outbreaks, we're also requiring restaurants, museums, gyms, and other customer-facing establishments to keep a daily log of all who enter their facilities. We've also directed, um, we're, we're going to be directing Vermonters to comply with requests made by the VDH contact tracing team because we need people to be cooperative and honest when they call. And as college students start to return home for the holiday break, whether from a Vermont school or out of state, they are required to quarantine for 14 days or seven days and a negative test. Please note, we are strongly encouraging these students to, to get tested after seven days. We've also seen some who are going back to our pre-pandemic ways. So we're requiring telework for those who can do so and discouraging in-person meetings. Essential workers and schools can continue to in, it can continue in-person operations. But things like staff meetings that can be done by video conference should do so. Finally, we're pausing recreational sports leagues, those outside of the BPA, <coughs> BPA sanctioned sports. Admittedly, <clears throat> this one is hard for me because our kids are trying so hard, but it continues to be another opportunity for gathering and can spread the virus amongst multiple counties and multiple schools. As we move forward, we'll be looking at this every week. And I hope youth sports will be one of the first things to reopen. 
And I hope these adults out there who haven't followed our guidance recognize the responsibility they have to help us slow the spread and get our cases down. I'm sure you all know <clears throat> we're at a tipping point. We still have an opportunity to get our arms around this alarming case growth and return to what we've grown accustomed to. But we all have to step up and commit to following the health guidance, including these new measures, and limit our contacts as much as possible. Now, at the same time, we're expanding testing and contact tracing protocols. So we're better positioned to hunt this virus down and stop it in its tracks. As I've said before, the good news is we've proven these steps are effective and that we can change our trajectory. And I want to thank those Vermonters who've done their part, who wear their masks, who skipped the Halloween party, canceled travel, and kept their social circles small. It's this type of commitment that will get us through this sooner. I know how hard it is to keep this up, but if we dig deep and double our efforts, we can get this under control. And we must, because this is about making sure we don't overwhelm our hospitals and save lives. It's about keeping our kids in school and our workers working. I know these are goals we all share, and we all have a role to play in order to stop the growing wave of infections, which is leading to more hospitalizations and sadly will lead to more deaths. So please, do your part so we can get things back to where we were before. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. You all know that we rely on data to guide each and every decision we make. And that data has shown us a clear picture of a rising tide that could have serious consequences. We've now seen transmission accelerate as reported cases have gone from 42 at the beginning of the week to 72 to 109, hitting new highs of the pandemic in Vermont. Last evening, there were an additional 84 recorded. Hospitalizations, too, are on the rise, with a total reported today of 21. You can see our total case count is 2,743, and our deaths remain stable, fortunately, at 59. Every Tuesday, we present to you a lot of uh, the modeling data and projections. Uh, I want us to focus today on the real-time data and you can make your own projections because you'll notice that the slope of the curve has markedly changed from where it has been for so long a time. This is the number of cases per day, which I've already stated to you. This is a pictorial representation. Clearly, we had some days that exceeded our early experience way back in March after this long, long period of small outbreaks, containment, moving on. The percent positivity rate, we have continued to be uh, noteworthy in the country regarding how we are doing. We've often been below 1%. You'll see now that the seven-day average actually isn't listed on the slide, I'm sorry but the positivity rate on November 10th was 1.76. I believe the seven-day average is between 1.3 and 1.5. Regarding syndromic surveillance, which is on the next slide, um, not a marked uptick, but you can already see that there is a change in the most recent days on the graph. Um, still at a lower level, but in some of our counties, the emergency departments have become exceedingly busy. So we anticipate those numbers will change. And then on my last slide, um, 
just to show you the nature of the, really the outbreak that began this entire progression, the ice sports team uh, outbreak, way back here in October, things have really settled down a little bit with regard to that, but they have not been extinguished completely. Um, and we need to keep watching that. Uh, but I use this not to necessarily focus on that particular outbreak, but to focus on the natural history of an outbreak and what can happen with very innocent events that then lead to community transmission in ways that people may never have imagined. As you'll see, we've gone from what we call the primary grouping to the secondary to now the tertiary infections that are still uh, petering out, so to speak. So just like we've had an increase in the number of cases, the same goes for the number of new situations our contact tracers are following. There can be a range of things that require more investigation and outreach than just a single case. These situations, we label them that way because they impact usually a kind of a facility whether the facility be a work site, whether it be a long-term care or health care setting, whether it be a uh, school or child care. Earlier this week, eight new situations were identified in one day. The following day, it was up to 16. The current total is now well over 80. The current total of outbreaks is 17. Too many to go into one at a time for you here during a press conference. Our teams, our data teams analysis also shows a rising number of gatherings leading to further spread and outbreaks. These gatherings can be parties, meetings, cookouts, get togethers with family or friends. Since October 1st, 71% of the cases that are associated with an outbreak are associated with an outbreak from a private party or a social gathering, 71%. So I've given you the data. I want to translate the data into a story. It's not one complete real story, I'm going to, as the way I'm going to tell it, but what it does, because every single component of the story is from real, actual scenarios that we've encountered just this past week in Vermont. It tells the kind of story everyone needs to hear. So let's start with a Vermonter. I'll name him Max. Max goes to his friend's house for dinner. There's a small group of old friends there, a couple of new acquaintances. He doesn't know where they come from even, but there's a couple of new acquaintances. And everybody's having a good time. No one really feels sick or seems sick to Max. What he doesn't know, of course, is that one person in that party was infectious at the time, probably in that 48-hour period before they might become symptomatic. And of course, Max is at a dinner party. What do you do at a dinner party? You eat, you drink, you socialize. So there are long periods of time when there's nobody wearing a mask, because how do you do those things with a mask on? And it's your friend's house, so you're not actually paying attention about how many inches or feet I am from a person. So Max comes home to his family, had a great time, but a few days later, he's not feeling perfect, but he kind of feels okay. Hasn't really noticed any major changes, but what he doesn't know is that he is actually infected now. And it's during this time, before he really realizes he's sick, that he can be infectious and infect somebody else and transmit the virus. But he feels well, so he goes to work. He owns an auto service shop. He's pretty good about wearing a mask and all that, but he and his three other employees take the same coffee break every day. And what do you do in a coffee break? Well, 
these three guys, these four guys drink coffee, eat some snacks, and lament about the Patriots. However, during that coffee break, those three other co-workers are potentially infected. They're certainly close contacts, but they're potentially infected. The four of them are the entire workforce, so Max has no choice but to close his business for a number of days. Let's talk about his wife, Nicole, who he lives with, of course. She lives at home with him, doesn't know he brought the virus home from their friend's house when he was at the dinner party. The only problem is Nicole's a teacher. So Nicole goes to school feeling well as well, but has now exposed her fifth graders and some staff at the school to the coronavirus. Eventually, she actually develops a cough, so she has to get tested, and her test comes back positive. Now there's a pod of fifth graders and two staff members in the school that have to stay out of the school. Their lives are disrupted for those two weeks. Potentially, the school's operation is disrupted if there's an impact on staffing that becomes significant. So that's how that works. But I didn't tell you one other thing. Max and Nicole have a daughter, Vanessa. Vanessa works as a nurse's aide at a local nursing home. We know ultimately from our experience in Vermont how devastating an outbreak among patients there could be. Vanessa knows that too. She doesn't live a life in the fast lane. She has been very careful. But why would she imagine just coming home and living in her own home would put her at risk of coronavirus. I won't play it out any further, but you can imagine the impacts if the nursing home has an outbreak. So my story is all about one social gathering with a very modest number of people. And I'm not exaggerating this story at all. This is exactly what the governor talked about and what I've talked about that we are seeing every day in our reports in Vermont. And unfortunately, when the virus is increasing in levels in our communities, this is what happens. We want to be together. We want to have some sense of normalcy. But I don't want this to be your story or any of our stories. Both the numbers and the information contact tracers collect tell us where the solutions are. Limiting contact among households in gatherings and in following the travel and quarantine guidance, period. Whether it's friends or our own family members, we need to limit any social activities to our own households to protect all those people that we can't even know we've put at risk. Where we work, where we learn, where people live, in situations that might make them more vulnerable. And unfortunately, we need to make these sacrifices now. You may recall that on Tuesday, I told you that we were on the threshold and that the decisions we make now will truly determine our future as we head indoors in these colder months. If we can act at this critical moment in time, our actions will still make a difference. Remember our very basic priorities and goals. Keep people working, keep kids in school, and save lives and hospitalizations by decreasing the number of cases. I want to add that as much as we talk about protecting each other from COVID-19, it's a good time to really think about protecting yourself. We hear about some people having no symptoms and most people recovering but there is still a range of outcomes from COVID-19, some with long-term effects, even for healthy people. And you just won't know how COVID will affect you until you get it. So please don't make assumptions with this disease. Take it seriously. I'm gonna conclude now with just a few essential points. Know when you need to quarantine and what that means. Travelers, close contacts of a positive case must stay home and away from others for 14 days or seven days with a negative test, assuming you have no symptoms. 
It's especially critical now with college students coming home for the holiday. We strongly encourage them to get tested as well. And they must quarantine. I've received a lot of mail about this and had to explain a lot of times about what quarantine really means. So please go to our healthvermont.gov website under COVID-19. There's very explicit instructions about what quarantine is and isn't. Second point, get tested. If you have COVID symptoms or you're a close contact of a positive case, or as we've already said this week, if you've attended social gatherings, get tested. It's an essential tool to finding and containing COVID. We appreciate your patience as our teams work hard to make testing even more available than it is now, when and where you need it. Thirdly, know how to prevent further spread. Testing is not prevention. You still need to wear a mask, stay six feet away, and stay home if you're sick. That includes even a mild symptom like a headache or a runny nose. And avoid non-essential travel. Fourth, answer any call from the health department and be forthcoming with information. The more cases and situations we have, the more we need your help so contact tracers can do their work. The quicker and more complete the information, the more likely we are to stop transmission and prevent an outbreak. Our experience these past many months, and I showed you on the graph, has taught us that Vermont knows how to contain this virus. There's no question we're facing real challenges as cases surge in Vermont and around the country. We want to get back to where we were, but we need your help. Accepting our situation and following the guidance the governor and I have described today is what we must do now. We may need to be apart more, but I know we're, that we are up to the challenge together. I'll turn it back to the governor. With that, we'll open it up to questions. All right, we have 25 in the queue, so please limit your questions. We'll start with Calvin. Um, thanks, Governor. I'd imagine um, a lot of bars and restaurants probably aren't too keen to hear the news today. Um, I know you're in, your administration's in the process of securing uh, a few more million dollars for business grants. Um, I guess, do you think that that will be enough? And I mean, if this, if people, I guess, especially with small gatherings, if they don't comply or we continue to see cases go up, um, I guess what, what help will be there for those restaurants and bars? Yeah, well, let, first of all, uh, the restaurants aren't, are not impacted. The bars will be closed, the clubs will be closed, um, the restaurants will be closed at 10 p.m. so they can still continue. Um, but I have a lot of sympathy uh, for the bar owners in particular. Uh, they're another business and they have a lot of employees who count on them um, for their income as well. So uh, this wasn't done lightly and that's why I'm fighting so hard uh, to take whatever remaining um, CRF funds we have uh, left over and we have about, uh, we've, we've set aside 75 million uh, for that, uh, that sector in particular and businesses uh, at large, uh, because we know they need it right now just to get through the, maybe in the next, uh, next month or so. But it's not anywhere near enough, not anywhere near. Um, we need, just for the hospitality sector alone, I would say we need five to 10 times the 75 million that we have today. We just simply don't have enough uh, to, to help. And we're under the same restrictions, the guidelines we had from before. Um, everything has to be expended by December 31st. So the, the clock is ticking. So we need to make sure that we get that out the door just as quick as possible. It's my understanding uh, the uh, Joint Fiscal Committee will take this up tomorrow morning or tomorrow at some point and uh, either give us a red light or a green light uh, in terms of whether we can use that money uh, for these businesses that are in desperate need. Uh, and again, I just want to reiterate, this is nowhere near enough. Uh, we're going to need some more help from uh, from Congress, 
I've spoken to our congressional delegation about this. I backed a, a text at a text exchange with Congressman Welch uh, today, um, and he's obviously on board. He understands our needs and uh, is doing everything he can uh, to get them to act, even in the lame duck session. And then I guess just a um, question for Dr. Levine dealing with college students returning. Um, you said that every college student needs to be quarantining when they come back, but a lot of schools have been doing their own testing. So let's just say I'm a student, I go to school with uh, North Carolina. I get a negative test there. I come straight here. I take a, neg a test. As soon as I arrive, I test negative. Do I still have to quarantine? I wish I had an answer that you want to hear, but the answer is you must still quarantine because you've come from a place that has even a higher positivity rate than anywhere here in the Northeast. And the day you test negative is just the day you test negative. It doesn't imply that your body is not incubating virus and that you won't become infectious. So that seven day period followed by the next test is really critical. It sounds like it's still possible with contact tracing to, um, to try and go after certain outbreaks and try and keep it from getting out of hand. But with the positivity rate increasing, how close is it to getting out of control? Is it possible to say how, how thin the margin is between being able to contain outbreaks with contact tracing and having the rate of spread get beyond our capacity to, to catch it? Yeah, our contact tracers are busy, uh, no doubt about it. We're, and we've uh, increased our capacity. We're going to continue to increase our capacity uh, so that we can meet the demand and make sure that we protect Vermonters as best we can. Um, but that's why we put some of these other measures in place to cut down on the number of cases so that we can, uh, so that we do have the capacity uh, to contact trace because that's part of the answer. The testing, contact tracing is part, part of the mitigation. Um, so. Uh, again, everything has to work at the same time, uh, but, uh, but our contact tracers, uh, the EPI team, is very busy uh, these days, and we need to all do our part to give them a break so they can catch back up. Anything either one of you want to add to that? Um, and yesterday, it sounded like Washington County was uh, a bit startling with the number of positive cases that mm -hmm. came out. Um, as we look at, at the upcropping, are there geographic locations that, that appear worse than others? For example, is it Washington County, Central Vermont? Is it Chittenden County? Uh, what's the geographic layout? Yeah, um, I, again, I don't know how specific we can get because it is widespread uh, throughout Washington County, even in Orange County, in the Chittenden County. But as you remember, as we laid out maybe a week ago, uh, with the outbreak at the skating facility, facility alone, the largest outbreak uh, that we've we've had uh, in Vermont. I think it's, uh, it's gone into over 150 cases at this point. Um, that, was, th that impacted St. Michael's College. Uh, so that impacted uh, Chittenden County. So that one event, that one, one action, um, had a, a huge ripple effect. And, and it's my belief, and I, and I don't have anything to back this up with, but I would say uh, the number of cases we're seeing in Washington County today is, 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 is a result of what happened uh, about a month ago at that skating facility uh, because it's still having the first and second generations of uh, the infections that we saw throughout. But I have nothing to, to back that up with, just my own personal feeling. And finally, will there be, at what kind, if so, of uh, enforcement with uh, the new uh, prohibition on multifamily gatherings? Um, yeah, again, this isn't a perfect system. Um, it's not as though we're going to have uh, someone out uh, trying to, uh, to find people or uh, to, to enforce. We're asking Vermonters to do the right thing here. They've done it before. That's, that's what's so promising about all of this. Um, in the initial um, stages of the pandemic, uh, Vermonters stepped up. They did the right thing. They stayed home, stayed safe, wore their masks uh, as, we, as we changed the guidelines along the way. And we had this under control. Um, but what we're seeing as a region, right, what we're seeing as a country, this has exploded and it's coming to our doorstep. And uh, we have to do all we can, again, uh, to take this on and, and protect ourselves and protect our neighbors, protect our families. 
um, because I know, again, we saw it, we proved it, we can do this. Um, but it's going to take all of us, all of us pulling in the right, same direction in order to be successful. So um, again, it's not perfect, no enforcement system in, in some respects, um, but I'm confident uh, that Vermonters will do the right thing as long as they understand what the mission is. Thank you. Uh, what kind of statement or, or, um, or action can you take uh, given the Fed's uh, the current situation with the uh, incoming president elect who should be taking uh, getting things going and up to speed and uh, a president who's stayed behind the scenes and really hasn't been seen other than one time since the election um, and it, what seems to be in action on on the federal front on COVID since the election uh, how does that play into your, you know, you're saying we need money now? Yeah. Um, well, again, I just want to remind everyone um, from the start, uh, we as individual states, we as Vermont, uh, we took things on ourselves. We didn't have a lot of help in the beginning. A lot, we didn't have a lot of guidance. Uh, but we did, did a lot of the right things for the right reasons. We listened to the data, the science, and Dr. Levine and, and er everyone else. And we did what we thought was right for Vermont. And we continued to do that uh, throughout the last nine months or so. Um, so we'll continue to do that. Um, we do need money in the future for our economy. Um, and I'm confident uh, that they will come to some agreement eventually. I don't know if it's going to be uh, in this lame duck session in December uh, or whether we have to wait until uh, the new president is sworn in. Uh, but. I'm confident that Republicans and Democrats alike will come together eventually to provide relief because we all need it, all states need this. Uh, but I also want to remind everyone that just because uh, uh, the president isn't acting or, and the president-elect isn't um, um, been briefed on a lot of issues, who, who, who should be, uh, by the way, um, but, um, but the bureaucracy is still working, um, the, I'm sure Dr. Levine is still in contact with his uh, uh, others around the country, as I am with other governors. Um, but the bureaucracy still works. The CDC, CDC is still there. And they're still doing their part. So um, I just want Vermonters to understand uh, that just because uh, the president might not be acting, uh, the, the bureaucracy itself is. But our elected officials in Washington uh, both on the congressional side and on the administration side are pretty much stalemated. Uh, nothing's happening. You guys are on the front lines dealing with this stuff. I was in a diner in southern Vermont yesterday and the owner of the diner was doing the waitressing, the screening, the cooking, and the serving. Uh, and she's down to just herself now running this small diner and she's saying, geez, you know, I, I, it's tough. It's yeah. really tough on these people. Yeah, um, my heart goes out to all of those, uh, particularly in, in businesses, and that's why I keep saying we need to provide some relief if, uh, if they need to shut down uh, during this, and, and we're asking bars are going to be shutting down. They need some help, financial help, uh, to make sure that they survive uh, for another day uh, so that when we the vaccine uh, comes into fruition uh, and is widely and safely distributed, uh, that, that those businesses are protected so they can get there, so they can survive uh, until we have some certainty on that front. So uh, we'll continue. Again, we've, we've done a lot of good work here in Vermont. We know how to do this. And uh, if we continue to, to rely on our, our um, team, you know, across state government, uh, and our team across all of Vermont, uh, Vermonters, um, we'll, we'll beat this, we'll, we'll survive. Um, but we're, again, we're all gonna have to work together in order to do that. And we're doing, we're doing just what we did from the beginning. Again, we didn't have a lot of help from the federal government in the few, first few months. Um, and we, we learned how to, uh, uh, you know, meander our way through this uh, successfully. And uh, we'll continue to, to do the, just just that, and try and protect Vermonters, and that's why we had to take the steps we did today.
Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, do you anticipate bringing the tickets back a little bit more, and at what point would you do that? Um, I know some governors are considering, you know, stay-at-home orders. Yeah. So at what point might you consider that? We'll continue. This is data-driven. Um, it has been since the beginning. And uh, again, as I said before, we've learned a lot over the last nine months. And so the measures, the steps we're taking today are because of the data uh, that we're seeing. And, uh, and we, we're targeting the areas that we see are problematic uh, and will continue to, to restrict in those areas uh, and trying to, uh, to be strategic in the way we do it. It's more surgical in some respects. Um, so, um, you know, nothing's off the table. We'll react accordingly based on what we see. And unfortunately, uh, it's not all our doing uh, here in Vermont. Um, we are susceptible uh, to what happens outside our borders, as we're seeing in New York and New Hampshire and Massachusetts and so forth. So, um, but, but again, the steps we've taken uh, over the last, uh, even the last week, has been because of what we're seeing, uh, what we're facing, and uh, we'll continue to do that. But, but we'll see what happens. So again, we meet multiple times a day, uh, and we are... Uh, really uh, data-driven uh, in this regard. Okay, and then um, one other thing. Um, you've talked about the importance you and Dr. Levine and Vermont are stepping up and doing their part. Um, you know, I just happened to be in two stores in Washington County yesterday where the only people, other people in there were not wearing masks. How do you reach those people who maybe are not paying attention to the news? Is there any other way to get this information out there? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's difficult. And some are just so reluctant uh, to, to wearing a mask and doing the right thing. Um, we, that's why we tell the stories uh, that we do. Uh, we try and uh, make sure that people understand how, this, how we got into the position we're in today um, by people being lax, not doing their part, or one individual or two or three, and then it, and then it multiplies. Uh, and the story that uh, Dr. Levine told you know that that could have come right out of an epi report that was that was what that's what happens um so uh it's not all um by someone not uh, doing the right thing uh, but at the same time um, we need to make sure uh, that everyone uh, calls them out and and you know we're we're going to tighten the screws uh, over, over the next uh, uh over the next couple of weeks we're going to do everything we can to communicate and make sure the message gets out and we're counting on all of you, all the media, all those listeners uh, today, to send the message. Uh, because again, if we are able to put these uh, prevention measures in place now, we'll benefit uh, a month from now. Dr. Levine. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to add on to the science on the masks, because that was in the news yesterday. Um, one of the blessings of the administration in Washington, not being very active right now on, on the pandemic is there's not politicization of things like masks that's in the news. But what is in the news, and again, this is a sorry state because it's the CDC again coming a little later to the table, but they're at the table, is that they have uh, basically affirmed uh, something I've been saying for a long time here in Vermont, that the mask is indeed altruistic. It protects the person you're talking to or in the room with from your droplets, but they also say now that it protects the wearer from aerosols and those fine particles that don't just drop to the ground but hang around in the air. So that's important uh, reaffirmation of science with a huge list of references um, that pretty much says masking is important and masking will protect others and yourself. So I want everybody to have that message once again. Thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, what are the latest numbers in Rutland Health and Rehab? We heard that there might be 20 residents there and five staff who have been tested positive. Yeah, Secretary Smith, I believe, has those numbers. This is uh, just, Eric, this is just as I left my office this morning. So we have 19 uh, residents who have tested positive, five 
who are negative, uh, four who are hospitalized. Now, those four are part of the 19. And uh, I received a call yesterday from an older uh, Barry resident saying that she had her oil fuel tank inspected and needs a part replaced. Uh, the contractors doing that work are booked up and the earliest she, she could get an appointment was the end of December. She said her fuel tank has about a third of a tank left and she's not going to last that long. She asked her fuel company to drop off some kind of fuel just to get her through and they said they can't because it's against the law. What did she to do in a situation like this? Yeah, again, I think Julie um, might be on the line, Secretary Moore. Um, we do have provisions for, for getting some fuel to that, uh, that Vermonter. Exactly. We are able to make uh, work with individual homeowners and fuel dealers and can typically make arrangements for um, a, a small amount of fuel to be delivered. We understand that there are, are contracted delays right now in affecting some of these repairs, um, but encourage uh, whoever reached out to you, they can either contact me um, or I to reach out to our Waste Management and Prevention Division and there's contact information on the website and they are happy to, to work with individuals to develop a site-specific solution. We don't want anyone going cold. I think what we Thank can you. do, what we can do, Eric, uh, from our end is uh, I'm sure that we can get a, a, another bulletin or reminder out to uh, the distributors, the fuel oil distributors, uh, making sure they understand uh, that there is a way uh, to accomplish this. So we'll do our, our part as well. It's a good reminder. Thank you, Governor. Colin, seven days. Hi, thanks. Um, I don't know what this question is for, but could someone just speak to, um, in any way, is this current spike is different from what we saw in the spring? Um, are, there, are there notable things that are sticking out to you that are markedly different from our first wave? That's me, Dr. Levine. I think first off, just looking at the graph I showed, the magnitude um, and if you listen to the news every day, you learn that we've surpassed 150,000 cases a day as a country. We've surpassed something in the high 60,000s for uh, hospitalizations as a country. So what we're seeing is we're on the trailing edge um, in Vermont of, of that phenomenon, but our data still shows we already have a higher peak than we did in the beginning. So there is all that to contend with. But I don't want it to be looked at all negative because there's a lot of positive. We're, we've entered this spike with adequate PPE, abundant testing that we're actually expanding even further, and adequate contact tracing, which we're expanding even further uh, to contend with the truly uh, high rise of uh, the number of cases on a daily basis. So uh, the preparedness part and the kind of understanding where this leads is much more clear uh, than it was in that first uh, part of the spike in uh, March. And again, we're being driven by current data, but being driven by current data, we know what the outcome will be if we just sat back and said, Numbers aren't going so well, but you know the whole country's not doing so well, so we're just gonna have to go along for the ride. Um, and we're not doing that because we know from early experience with this virus and that first spike exactly what you will expect and what will happen and how rapidly things can go out of control in a virus that uh, grows exponentially in the population. So, you have any other things to add? Secretary Smith's going to add a couple. Colin, that's a, that's a great question. We were discussing it earlier this morning. We are much more prepared than we were in March. You've got to remember that there hadn't been a pandemic in 100 years. So when we entered into March, um, we were building the airplane as we were flying it. Uh, in this instance and in this spike, 
We've got the infrastructure in place. We've got the airplane built. What we have to do is make sure we fly through this turbulence in, in the best method that we can. And I think some of the steps that we take, we've taken today, real, and the surgical approach that we've taken today, really show us uh, what we've learned in the past few months. Thanks for that. And just, just to follow up quickly for Dr. Levine, is there, I know our numbers are currently higher, but I also know that we are testing a lot more. Um, do we, I mean, is there any sense that there, the virus is a lot more prevalent throughout the state right now that we maybe were not catching it based on the amount we were testing in the spring? Or do you have, I mean, is there any data on that or anything you could say as if you were trying to compare the two spikes? Yeah, I do think there are differences in the prevalence in the state. Um, and if we use the color analogy, about half of our counties are what we would consider red now, but class, glass half full, half of our counties are green and yellow, okay? So your question is really asking, are, are the green and yellow just being under-tested and we don't really know how much disease is there? But I think our testing is pretty uniform and though it has been strategic where we pop things up in areas of uh, high activity, we still are testing adequately uh, around the state. And our percent positivity being a little higher, if I could use that as a glass half full as well, the reality is if you're only testing the people who are sick, your numbers are really high. You'll be 10%, 20%, 50% positivity. But if you're testing the people who are really sick, and we know they're presenting, uh, just conversations with the Central Vermont Medical Center Emergency Department where you know we have one of the highest levels of activity. Uh, people are presenting when they need to present and they get tested. But we also have a lot of people who are getting tested either for symptoms or for contact that are not testing positive. And so we know that the whole population is kind of being sampled reasonably well. So I, I feel comfortable with that. Thanks. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello. Um, a reader uh, called and got in touch with me and said that he had recently learned that both uh, iPhone and Android phones have a built-in app that is intended to facilitate, I think, contact tracing. Um, but both of these require the states that the uh, phone users reside in to have a corresponding app. Vermont doesn't. Is there a reason for that, uh, or is it something that you're contemplating? Yeah, I, we, I think we went over this on yeah. Tuesday. Uh, Commissioner Pichek is much more articulate than I will be on the subject. Um, I'm not sure if he's on the line, but... Uh, but possibly if you could hold that question, Joe, until Tuesday, um, we, we have a better answer because uh, Commissioner Pichak has it. But it, um, we're in the early stages, as I, re I recall. Um, it's not, um, everyone has to agree to it. Um, it's not, uh, it has to be done on a volunteer basis. So uh, it's not something that we're, we're working on right now, but, but it could be something in the future. I think that's where we somewhat left it. But, but um, if you could, um, if you could hold that until Tuesday, or we can have Commissioner Pichek uh, contact you if you'd like. The letter would be fine if you spoke about it. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll have, uh, um, I'll see if he can do that. I have one other question, which is, um, you're talking about restaurants for in-person service at 10 p.m. What is the significance of 10 p.m.? I mean, why does that, um, why would that have uh, lower transmission rates? Well, again, I think we're just trying to uh, make sure that we we have a end date, so to speak, um, and we're consistent uh, with others. I listened to other governors uh, throughout the last few months. And the, let's say, um, I remember uh, Governor Ducey from Arizona, and uh, they imposed some restrictions early on, and they wish they had had those uh, in the beginning. And some of them were closing the bars and, uh, and having a, um, a closed uh, date or a time. 
uh, that um, that would help them so that it wouldn't go uh, last longer. You know, the longer uh, some folks are at a, a gathering or at a restaurant, um, let's be honest, uh, the, the more they might partake in having a, a few more drinks uh, and the louder it gets and, and the more people are there. So we're just trying to, um, you know, put some parameters around this uh, and uh, we think this is a strategic way of, of doing so. Aaron, VT Digger. Oh, um, um, I uh, I noted that you said that there's been a rise in the number of individual outbreaks and the number of situations that are affected. Um, what does the health department think its capacity is for contact tracing as the number of not just cases rise, but individual situations rise. I imagine that for each one, you kind of have to undergo your own separate um, contact tracing effort. Uh, Dr. Levine. Yeah, we've looked at this uh, long and hard, and uh, our original estimate was that the standard contact tracing workforce that we have dedicated to this effort should be able to handle in the range of 90 new uh, cases per day. So uh, we don't do it by situations or outbreaks because we do it by cases. The thing we've learned is that the cases are growing a little faster than anyone would have anticipated. But more importantly, the work of contact tracing, in addition to the case, is connecting with all the contacts. And over the, the time curve of the pandemic, the number of contacts per case has increased. And so there are a few more contacts per case every time now that have to be factored into the equation of how much work that's going to be for an individual contact tracer. That's why um, we've activated um, sort of our reserve contact tracing, work, contact tracing workforce at the health department and have additional resources coming in from around the state uh, and people who have somewhat been trained already and others who will need to be newly trained uh, because we do want to keep up with this demand. Yeah, um, so does that also have an effect on not just outbreaks and situations but also kind of the broader community spread that we're seeing in say Washington County where it's not traceable to any one particular outbreak. I guess what I'm saying is, is that even more challenging because it doesn't have like a clear connection? It's, it's not actually, no, it's not any, any more challenging because um, there are actually more cases than you would realize where it's impossible to tell where that came from. Um, and, and that's just the nature of this beast dealing with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is when it's in a community, sometimes it's very hard to pin your uh, culprit case down. But I want to emphasize the words contact tracing, they're really not designed around tracing back to where the virus came, though that's a core function. The contact tracing is really making sure that other people who are traced back to the person you already know as a case can be quarantined so that they will not endanger the health of anyone else around them. So you can snuff things out right there because the pathways of infection are being stopped to the best of your knowledge because anyone who was in contact with the case that you're doing the contact tracing on has been identified and appropriately guide appropriate guidance has been provided. I remember the department called put out a report a couple months ago on known versus unknown versus exposure. I think it's good to see an update to that kind of features. Um, but anyway, that's, that's all for me. Uh, thank you. Liz, Liz, the Burlington Free Press. Hi, thank you. I have a few questions. The first is for the governor. Um, I know, Governor, that you said that you're hoping that 
um, you know, Vermonters will do the right thing and follow these new um, guidelines or new new rules very closely. Um, I'm wondering, you know, now that you've banned um, multiple house gatherings, um, if there are any consequences for outbreaks after the ban that can be traced back to um, a multi-house gathering. Well, well, certainly, I'm not sure what the question is, but uh, the contact tracing, hopefully uh, people would be forthright and honest about uh, when someone from the state, uh, from the EPI team contacts them, uh, that they won't we'll leave any details out because if they do, it'll have a detrimental effect on someone's at some point. And the ripple effect, as Dr. Levine uh, talked about in his story, is dramatic. So uh, first of all, just make sure you answer truthfully, honestly, forthright. Uh, and don't leave those details out because that's important. Um, we don't have an enforcement mechanism, if that's what you're asking. Um, but um, yeah. but again, <clears throat> we're not, uh, I don't believe we're at that point. Uh, what we need to do is just make sure uh, people do the right thing and, uh, and give us all the information we need. Because again, just that one little piece of information that you might have left out mm -hmm. uh, could slow everything down and, and could lead to an outbreak somewhere else. Uh, you know, a week or two down the road. So it spreads so quick. Uh, so just be just be honest. I, I, they, I'm sure they'll do it. Uh, I'm sure that they uh, will do the right thing uh, because again, it could affect their family, their friends, their neighbors, uh, and uh, all across Vermont. Great. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, it was um, kind of pointing to the enforcement mechanism, but kind of after um, a contact tracer has, has traced back to multi-house gatherings that happened after you banned them, um, if there's any enforcement there. Yeah, again, I, there there could be in the future. We haven't contemplated that at this point in time. Um, I might ask maybe Commissioner Sherling if he wants to weigh in on any of this at this point. Uh, thanks, Governor. Uh, really not much more to add um, than that. Okay, well, uh, again, if we uh, if we see um, multiple violations, obviously we'll do what we can uh, to make sure there's guidance and uh, and education that's involved, and we can always resort to something more stringent in the future. But uh, but right now, it's really about getting that information um, because we we have to stay ahead of this. That's that's the point. And if we, you know, if there's an, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it does strike me uh, it's an opportunity to reemphasize that we are uh, starting today going out and doing compliance assessments uh, at a variety of, of businesses, and I think uh, the future posture will be informed by uh, what we find over the next uh, several days as we do that. Um, we're certainly hopeful, again, that we'll find a broad compliance, especially in the wake of the experience that Vermont is having right now. Thank you. Um, my second question has to do with um, the, uh, I guess, urging Vermonters to give complete information to contact tracers. Um, has that not been happening? You know, again, from my standpoint, and um, I don't have any direct knowledge other than anecdotal, and I know people who have been contacted uh, who haven't given all the exact information, or I have left something out. So I think it's happening. I don't know if we can point to anything in particular, um, but I might ask Secretary Smith to uh, comment further. Obviously through the last um, um, eight or nine months, we've had instances where people have not been cooperative uh, have not provided us the right information or in some cases the wrong information. If you, the most recent cases is we, we had a Halloween event where people were not answering the phone um, and, and not getting back to the contact tracers and we, and, and in some cases not providing info that was fully truthful to be honest. So uh, I think, you know, the executive order uh, mentions that to please when somebody, when the health department calls, answer the phone, provide information that's, uh, that's truthful um, and is full, as the governor said, 
is as much information as you can give to that contact tracer and then comply with the recommendations from the health department, in particular when they, when they ask you to quarantine. So um, these are, you know, this, this is built on things that we've experienced over the, over the several months, but um, we've seen it just recently with uh, some of the Halloween parties. Thank you. Ed, Newport Daily Express. We have a whole plan in place. Obviously, we're looking for um, any types of, uh, of interest in providing for that space. Um, but maybe uh, what we can do, Ed, is uh, I can have somebody from BGS uh, get in touch with you directly, uh, Buildings and General Services, or um, um, maybe Secretary Young, just so you can go through that. We can go through the process with you. I don't have everything, all the details here, and it'd be unfair to to mislead you in any way. So. Uh, in the, you know, talking about some of the COVID-related items today, I'd like to stick to that if I could. Okay, that's fine. We'll have somebody get a hold of you. Okay, thank you. Hadley, the Valley Reporter. Hi, Governor. Uh, my first question is related to contact tracing and the fact that many people aren't answering contact tracing calls because they come from unknown numbers. So do contact tracers call from Vermont area codes only? And would you recommend that people pick up the phone if they receive an unknown call from an 802 number? Yeah, good, good question, uh, Dr. Levine. Yeah, with the enhanced volume of uh, all the cases and the need for multiple people on the phone all the time, they no longer come from one 802 number that uh, is more identifiable as the health department. So they all come from 802 numbers, um, but uh, you may not recognize the number. Um, They'll leave a message. Uh, and you know, most of the time, they will leave a message. It won't be a very specific message, but it'll let you know that it's the health department. So please pick all up right. the message if you don't pick up the phone. Thank you. And my next question is for Dan French, and it's about the state current music education guidelines, uh, which don't allow students to sing or play instruments together inside, even while socially distanced with masks on. So for a little bit of context, I spoke with a local music educator who happens to sit on the council of the National Association for Music Education, and she said she was um, appalled at the hypocrisy in state guidelines which let students practice sports indoors for hours at a time while those same students can't take this curricular music class for credit um, indoors if it involves singing or playing instruments together. And uh, she was also upset to see that no one from the arts was actually involved in writing uh, the state guidance on music. So my question is, Will the state revisit music education guidelines or consider giving music educators a seat at the table when it comes to writing those guidelines? Yeah, hi, uh, Secretary French, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, music has been very challenging for us. Um, you know, to your point about hypocrisy, we do look at each activity separately. So 
uh, kind of like if we found a path forward with one activity, we would automatically allow another activity. And there's been quite a bit of research on music that makes it really challenging uh, to provide accommodations to school. And we've been struggling with that with our team uh, and with music educators all summer long. Um, most recently, uh, we're, we reached out, uh, music association educators reached out to us as well. Um, and we're, we're meeting, we formed a little work group to see what we can do. But it is, it's a very challenging area for us to find a way to do it. All right, thank you. Kat, WCAS. Hi, this question is for Dr. Levine, and likely in a kind of a similar vein to a question that was asked earlier, but I'm curious whether we actually have more COVID-19 virus in our communities right now versus we, when we did earlier in the pandemic. Um, because as you talked about earlier, we do have more testing capacity right now to catch cases that are out there. But do we actually think that there is more cases we're catching and the virus load is actually lower right now, or do we have um, more virus now and we're getting better at catching it? Can I always count on you for a challenging question, Kat? <laughs> this one doesn't have a straightforward answer, but I can give you my best guesstimate of the answer. Um, there clearly is more virus prevalent in our communities. Um, a lot of that related to the fact that, as we've said many times, it's been encroaching on our state, both nationally and more recently regionally, for a while. So more virus has entered the state. However, I wouldn't want people to mistake that for we never had the virus in the state. The virus has been here since March. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's waiting to do its thing. It's always been here. And now that the weather got colder, even before the recent warm snap. The weather got colder, people are more indoors, and there were more gatherings, and as the governor's uh, calendar told him, the dates were right for Halloween parties. People are in the uh, time frame that is much more opportunistic for them to be able to give the virus to somebody else. So part of it is more came into the state, but there was always a bunch of it in the state, it's still here, and it's now no longer summer. People are indoors giving it to each other uh, because the conditions that are right for that to happen. Okay, so you don't think then that it was, you know, we had exactly this much virus in the community earlier in the pandemic and we just didn't have the testing capacity to catch it all? No, I, I think that in the very, very early, March, April, yes. Uh, that was a definite problem that, you know, was not our problem. It was a national problem and a crisis. But since the late spring through the summer, up until a month or two ago, um, testing was always on our radar. Testing was being done really frequently. It spiked even higher with the college students, but the fact is we still had a lot of testing of non-college student Vermonters. So, uh, it's not because of uh, testing that we're seeing more cases now. And I think, based on what I'm hearing about emergency rooms and things, that we're starting to see more people who have symptoms leading to them getting tested, not just people who might need to be tested to get out of quarantine or because they've been in contact with someone. Um, and I think what we ask people to do, which is if you've been to a social gathering, but we don't care how you feel, you should get yourself tested because you put yourself in a higher risk situation. So I see, I think we're seeing the impact of that as well. So very multifactorial, but um, the fact of the matter is there's more virus uh, around and the virus that was always around is getting transmitted person to person. Thank you, I appreciate adding the context to kind of some of the numbers that we report where we go, well, we had hit a record number of cases. Um, and said, well, what does that mean? Um, and how did that compare earlier in the pandemic? So I appreciate that. My second question is for, because I know we're going to get this one in an email from people today. Um, they're going to say, you know, these new rules are punishing people who were already following the rules, you know, and the people who weren't listening to you to begin with weren't, aren't going to listen to you now just because there's a mandate. Do you feel, though, that this mandate will actually get the message across to people? Oh, well, we certainly hope so. Um, we're going to count on peer pressure as well. And uh, the more we get this information out, the more we articulate 
what the problem is. Um, I think the quicker we solve it, and uh, it's going to take each and every one of us to do that, but we're going to have to educate each other as well. Um, I, you know, again, when I said I don't take this lightly, uh, shutting down businesses isn't something that I look forward to doing. Um, taking away uh, youth sports is not something that I look forward to doing. Uh, but I think it's necessary at this point in time. And, and uh, again, the quicker we comply, the quicker we get this under control, the quicker we can get back to what we experienced before. Thank you, I appreciate it. Courtney, Local 22. Hi, my question is what your reaction is to a number of large um, businesses, companies with essential employees opting not to apply to the state hazard pay grant program that would impact um, thousands of Vermont frontline workers. Yeah, obviously, um, we're urging them to apply um, so that the, uh, their employees can benefit. Um, I did uh, have some correspondence or, uh, with, uh, with Walmart in particular, sent them uh, a letter, uh, and I think some of our administration has heard back from them. Um, but we've seen uh, this week uh, where other larger entities have uh, said that they are going to take a second look. Uh, they didn't uh, think it applied to them. Uh, and we're trying to, to make sure they have all the information needed uh, so that they can uh, take advantage of this for their employers, employees, not for themselves, but for the employees. So uh, we're, we're still working this through. We've extended the date uh, as well as uh, there's money available uh, so that uh, we want them to take advantage of this. Thank you. All right, we just a quick time check here. It's 12.22, we're about 50 minutes into the questions and we are uh, just over halfway through the queue. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, first, just a quick point of clarification. Does the halt of recreational sports mean that commercial bowling alleys need to shut down and, and is this order an extension of your state of emergency order? Yeah, two parts. That I believe I believe it does um, affect bowling alleys, um, and I also and it is part of the executive order. But that was due to expire. Isn't it tomorrow or something? Yeah, I think it's Sunday, or maybe maybe it's tomorrow. But I I think it's this weekend. So this is an extension of the executive order uh, that uh, I'm I, I'll sign today. And for Dr. Levine, uh, wanted to ask about COVID uh, fatigue. Uh, we received several inquiries, and I know other reporters and editors were baffled at the end of the last news conference when the last questioner asked about an unpublicized outbreak at a Rutland senior facility. There were seven or eight seniors and a staff member, I think, at the time. And it was, uh, I was just wondering why. Uh, was it COVID fatigue for not disclosing that outbreak, uh, unlike the, what the state did earlier with the broken facilities, or was it a planned decision by the state not to inform Vermonters about the Rutland outbreak? Uh, certainly was none of the above. Um, as I've kind of pointed out today, there are so many outbreaks, so many situations, and they're developing moment to moment we couldn't possibly stand here and, and go through them all. Um, and we have no interest in not being transparent about the Rutland outbreak, and Secretary Smith just presented the numbers on it again today uh, when he got questioned about it. Um, and we obviously consider it quite significant and uh, watching it very closely and providing as much support as we can. Um, the health outbreak prevention response team has been doing everything it always does in such situations. And uh, we always check with these facilities about PPE uh, adequacy at the time. Uh, so um, nothing, nothing uh, in the area of not being transparent. And certainly pandemic fatigue is not accounting for anything we do or don't say to people. Um, it's just we can only provide so much information at a given press conference. I think Secretary Smith wants to add to that. But can I just ask you a clarification? Last news 
day, the, the, the large uptick and everything like that had not happened. And, and after two plus hours and all the charts and graphs and everything, it wasn't disclosed. So uh, should we be asking for the top five outbreaks each day? Uh, maybe you can't give us all, but at least ask for the top five. Hey, Mike, this is uh, Mike Smith. I did disclose it on last Tuesday. I talked about the number of uh, people that were affected at the time. I can't remember what numbers I used during that, uh, that period, but I gave the numbers of both uh, positives at that facility and uh, of residents and um, of staff. And I believe I actually mentioned the hospitalizations as well. No, you, you were forthcoming once the question was asked, no question about it, but it was the last questioner of the day, more than two hours in the press conference before there was an ask for a confirmation and you were kind enough to confirm and give the numbers. But yeah. uh, what I'm getting at it, is there was no disclosure early on. Yeah, it was a breaking situation at the time. I wanted to make sure that we had all the numbers, and it was happening as we were at the press conference that I was getting these numbers. Great. Okay. Thank you all very much. Liam, VPR. Hi. Um, I had a question just kind of clarifying a little bit about the, uh, the ban on multiple household social gatherings. Um, you know, just trying to get a sense for people, you know, what that actually looks like. I mean, should they be thinking about this as sort of um, similar to the way the stay at home order was structured where people are really just supposed to, you know, hunker down and stay in their, in their, you know, their places where they live and not interact with anyone else? I guess it's a little different now since people could still theoretically go out to a restaurant, I guess, or, you know, go to school. Um, and I'm just trying to clarify a little bit of what this should look like and how people should be behaving um, since it, it, people might have some questions about whether they can go for a walk with somebody or see the people in the trusted household that they have been potting with during this time. Yeah, um, this, is, uh, this is obviously different than the beginning. Uh, this is not stay home, stay safe. Uh, this is uh, make sure, this is really about um, socially isolating, separating in some respects. So uh, it, unless it's in your, your your current household, um, you shouldn't interact with anyone. You shouldn't interact with your neighbor. You shouldn't get together uh, for, um, you know, horseshoes or, or having a beer or a coffee or anything like that. You should. You need to stay uh, away from each other. So this is exactly, um, you know, the predicament we're in at this point. Uh, we don't. You can go out for a walk, um, but you can't go out for a walk with your neighbor. Uh, if that makes sense. So this is uh, different than stay home, stay safe, because you can still go out, you can still go out, to, you can uh, get your groceries, you can do everything that you need to do, uh, but you can't interact socially uh, with uh, with others around you uh, that you aren't connected with within your household at, as of that moment, if that makes sense. It, it does, I mean, I, I just, I think it kind of, raises some questions of, you know, if a gym is still open, if a restaurant is, are still open. I mean, if these are activities that inherently involve some degree of social interaction, even if you're just going with, say, like, you know, the, you're someone that you're in your own household with. Um, I know in the past you you and Dr. Levine have said just because something is allowed doesn't mean you should do it. Um, so I'm just sort of wondering what your message to, to Vermonters is if you're going to kind of continue to allow some activities but say not to do other things. Yeah. We want everyone to, to just be careful. Those are structured environments, whether it's a gym or whether it's a restaurant, uh, there are structure, uh, there are guidelines in place there. There isn't much for, you know, the interactions with your, with your neighbor. So I would, uh, you know, I would want to, and I'll ask Dr. Levine to add to this, but if it were me, I would ask myself, um, you know, some of the questions that you, you're asked um, when you go to the dentist or something else. Uh, they ask you whether you've been uh, sick, whether you've been in contact with anyone else who's been sick, have you been on public transportation. Ask these questions of anyone you come in contact with, and are you willing, uh, you know, uh, for that half hour of interaction uh, with, the, with another person, uh, someone, um, maybe a neighbor or a friend, uh, that you uh, don't know where they've been, 
are you willing to uh, to quarantine for 14 days as a result of of having that interaction with them? You know, ask yourself, are you willing to sacrifice that because you could be getting a call uh, the very next day because that person was in contact with a positive case. So um, it's just that simple, Dr. Levine. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is nobody knows who's got what, who harbors virus, who doesn't harbor virus, who's in a pre-symptomatic infectious stage, who's not. But everything is laid out very clearly, as the governor said. When you go to a restaurant, it's as a household, not as multiple households. When you go to the gym, there's very clear guidance to the gyms about how to distance people. And it's not a social experience, it's an individual exercise experience. When you go to work, um, you don't have coffee breaks, like in my story, with everybody who you work with. Uh, if you all have a reason to be there, and you need to be there in person at work, you do your job, but you don't necessarily create the situations where you'll expose yourself to each other. Those are kind of the things we're telling people right now. Um, so it doesn't mean stay home by any means. We have noticed just on another topic that um, there are times that people are teleworking, which is fine, and we recommend that. But then when they need to have a larger meeting of getting everybody together, they choose to not do it online, but they choose to do it in a conference room. Um, that's probably not the behavior that we're recommending at this point in time. That's uh, really going to be conducive to worksite transmission of virus. So we would encourage that environment to be on Zoom or some other platform and not in person. So it takes a great deal of, you know, unfortunate thinking about what you're doing every day, which um, I think will become very natural. But at the same time, um, we're recommending that you try to live your lives in as full a way as possible, but without that, ish, that dimension of that socialization and uh, getting together with those who aren't in your household. Thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, just a quick clarification to start with. Uh, with the order that was released today, um, am I under the understanding that on the eve of rifle season, those who are attending a deer camp with maybe two families that, that split a deer camp, that would be restricted? Yeah, technically it would. Um, so when someone uh, is going to deer camp now and they're, they're going to be uh, interconnected with others from another household, uh, be prepared to, to quarantine when you get home. Okay. Um, and we're hearing from some employers that uh, are having trouble submitting their application for the hazard pay program. Uh, that deadline is today. If if employers are having trouble getting through and, and have been having trouble most of the week getting through, will the state work with them into next week? Or if they don't get through by the end of the day today, are they done? I, I believe there's an extension in place, but uh, maybe I can have uh, Commissioner Pichek reach out to you or uh, uh, maybe Secretary Curley has that information. On the hazard pay? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I do not. I think that uh, Commissioner Pichek would be better to ask about that. I'll, I'll have Commissioner Pichek uh, get in touch with you, Greg. Okay. And uh, lastly, um, when it comes to setting public policy, the World Health Organization sets the value of the human life at $10 million. Um, with the $1.25 billion that Vermont received, that, that means that Vermont should have saved at least 125 Vermonters' lives. Um, do you believe that we saved at least that many to date? And when you, as you're moving forward, uh, what kind of value do you set on human life when you uh, decide to restrict or not restrict yeah, I, sectors I, of the economy. I would say we don't put uh, a value uh, like that, not a numerical value on someone's life. It's it's like priceless. So every life, life is important from my perspective. And um, so we don't look at it in, in those terms. Uh, I will say uh, that uh, 
I believe Vermont's done fairly well. Uh, we have the lowest number of deaths uh, in, uh, in the U.S. We have M per capita. Um, so um, we've, done, uh, we've done fairly well in that regard. But, but again, we've lost 59, 59 lives have been lost through the pandemic. And that's, uh, that's not something I take lightly. So, I mean, if, if, if every life was priceless, the entire economy would be shut down. So I'm, I'm well, just trying to get yeah, I'm not, at, what I'm saying is I'm not putting a, I can't put a dollar figure on that. I'm not going to put a dollar figure on that, if that's what you're getting at. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Avery, WCAX. Governor, you mentioned taking this week by week. So with these new restrictions, what is your advice to Vermonters for Thanksgiving? Not not to travel, obviously, but for just like in Vermont. Do you just recommend they do it in their immediate household just with them? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, I know this is going to be unusual. Um, this is going to be difficult. Uh, this is something that most of us have not experienced. Uh, we want to see our families, uh, you know, again, with my my own mom, I haven't seen her physically uh, for a year. Um, I have a daughter who lives in Rhode Island. I haven't seen her since this pandemic started, probably almost a year as well. Uh, so this is uh, difficult on all of us, but it's really important uh, that you don't um, have Thanksgiving dinner uh, with friends and family uh, that are not part of the household you currently have today. Um, because it's just that important. Um, maybe put it off. Maybe we can have Thanksgiving at another uh, time with the rest of the family when we get this under control, but it's not right now. We're at a critical time here in Vermont and um, asking you, Vermonters, uh, to sacrifice one more time. Um, don't get together as a, as, a, as a family or with friends outside of the normal household. And a quick question for Dr. Levine. Has the UVM cyber attack had an impact on test results getting back to some people getting tested for COVID? The question was, does the cyber attack have an impact on test results getting back timely? So, so, so yes, the answer is yes, we are aware of cases that that pertains to. However, I believe at the Tuesday press conference, Secretary, Secretary Smith talked about the numbers of fax machines in the teens, I believe. Uh, so again, because they've had to resort to paper and uh, more uh, outdated technology, I'll use that word, um, they've been able to become effective with using that as a surrogate for their usual information systems and are now caught up with the backlog of what they had previously. So I think that's an important point. Uh, so my hope is that I won't be hearing into the future that people still find that the results aren't getting back to them in a timely way. But one caveat there is that uh, some of the results have been sent to, not some of the results, some of the specimens have been sent to uh, a lab that has had a longer than expected turnaround time out of state, uh, which we have no control over, but we've tried to divert those specimens from going there in the future if they can go to other places with a faster turnaround time. I also want, I also want to just uh, reinforce one other point that came up in your first question, uh, because I don't want to set unrealistic expectations. While I would love to see our cases get back to 20 cases in the next five to seven days because we've done this, we know that that is not scientifically valid reasoning. Um, one has to realize that the cases will continue to go up just because of people getting infected uh, as we speak, even before the implementation of the plans you've heard about today. So one needs to give several weeks time duration to go by to begin to see the kind of impact that you'd want to see. But I do want to remind people that we did see that back in March and April. Uh, and so. Again, setting your expectations realistically, but not feeling that, oh, Thanksgiving will come and this will have accomplished its task so we can then back off because that's not enough days gone by yet when you think that this is the 13th of November. Thank you. Thank you.
Who would have thought fax machines would make a comeback? <laughs> Drive-ins. <laughs> Don't throw those eight tracks away either. Peter, VPR. Governor, when you answered the question about deer camp, um, you said if people are going to do that, they're going to go to deer camp with people outside their household, they need to be prepared to quarantine if they do. Is that, a, is that allowable behavior under this order that you've issued? Uh, again, un un for there? unfortunately, uh, Peter, some are heading out or there right now. I mean, deer season starts on Sunday when I used to go to deer camp. I might leave on Thursday, so I would anticipate many of them have already gone, uh, are not going to get this information uh, before, uh, before. well, actually, this goes into effect on at 10 p.m. on Saturday. So, um, you know, it's just we have to be practical about this. Uh, not everybody's going to, to hear this, but if, uh, if they're listening to, to it right now and they want to prevent uh, a, a quarantine period or another test, a seven days and a test, uh, they should rethink uh, going to, to deer camp with this group of people uh, outside of their households. So is it an option for people to get together with people outside their household? Again, I, I, this, is not, this is not perfect, uh, Peter. Um, this is something, again, that's breaking today. Uh, and uh, for someone who's already there uh, and or is, is not going to hear this until, uh, until next week sometime, I'm just saying, no, this isn't preferable. I don't want people to, to get together with their family and friends from outside their household. That's not the message. And I think we should be very clear about that. That's not what we're, we're trying to, to do uh, here. We're trying to get people to prevent this uh, from happening, prevent the spread from, from getting together in the first place. But if they do, for whatever reason, and, and I would say we're in a transition period, especially this weekend, um, be prepared to to, um, to uh, quarantine when you're when you come back. Um, and Commissioner Levine, uh, the modeling that was issued as recently as Tuesday um, did not forecast the spike that we've seen. Um, has that? at all called into question the effectiveness of the formula you're using and, and are you revisiting um, the variables that go into that forecast um, given the fact that it did not predict what we're seeing right now? I'm going to let Commissioner Pichak answer most of that on Tuesday, but I will say the modeling has predicted the increases. I think what you're referring to is maybe the magnitude of the increase, especially on the day that we had over 100, uh, which you're right. Um, we need to see how these trends play out and where they settle out. And if they're going to be consistently over 100 or less, it's hard to know. But the fact is, the modeling has been accurate in telling us this month and next month and into the winter are going to be much different than what we've had in the summer. And we've been gearing up and trying to uh, adhere to that guidance all along. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Just be clear, bowling alleys are still open. You just can't go with anybody but someone in your household and, and gym the same way. I, I, I searched the uh, executive order. I didn't say anything specific to that. Maybe um, Commissioner Sherling or Secretary Curley could answer this. Yeah, I, I can help, Governor. Yes, we, um, bowling alley uh, would continue to fall under what we refer to as Section 8.1. We have not uh, hit pause on that. Rather, it's the section that talks about sports, organized sports replay. So, yes, if you were going to a bowling alley with members of your same household, you could do that. But we have um, paused please play at this point. Okay, and as far as the, um, thank you for that, and as far as the, um, the 75 million, could that change, Governor, if all of a sudden you had to open up all these surge sites, would you have to redirect that money, or, or is that money already set aside for the surge site? No, I think we're in, in we're all, all set in terms of the surge sites, but uh, we know that uh, what businesses are facing today 
uh, they, they need the money and we need to disperse it before the end of uh, December. So I think we're, we're okay. We're in good shape, at least for the near future. Um, but we're going to need Congress to act uh, to help both economically and from a health standpoint uh, in the very near future, you know, after the first of the year. And, and that, sure. And as for the hazard uh, pay, a lot of people are wondering, well, why don't, why don't these big companies uh, just do this? What's, what's the holdup on their side? It sounds like what you're saying is that they didn't realize they, they could be. Is that the case with Walmart? I think there's, there's a yeah. multitude of reasons, Tim, um, and I don't know all of them, probably better if you call them and ask them uh, their reasoning. Uh, but from what I've heard, again, some didn't think uh, that they qualified because they were a large corporation, just didn't understand the program. Um, so they needed some education there. Others uh, wanted to, uh, I think they were thinking they were being altruistic uh, because they, they thought that there were other smaller companies that were more impacted than they were and they'd done a lot for their own employees. So they didn't feel as though um, they just wanted the money to go to, to others uh, in greater need. Uh, but again, this isn't about the companies, it's about the employees. So we are advocating, asking them to, um, to uh, come to the aid of their employees. This money's available. Uh, we have some um, that we've extended the date. We have some that uh, more money available now. And uh, we just want them to apply on behalf of their employees. Ann Wallace Allen, VT Digger. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, hi, Governor. So um, I'm, I'm curious about this, um, these restrictions on social behavior. How does not going for a walk with my neighbor square with my ability to continue eating in a restaurant? Yeah, I think um, we just went through that, Ann. I mean, this, the restaurants are more structured. Um, we're not saying you can go to a restaurant with your neighbor. Uh, we're saying you can go uh, to the restaurant with your your family, your immediate family, your household members, and um, your, there are guidelines in place once you get there. Um, so much different than you going out uh, with your neighbor for an hour or two walk uh, side by side, where you don't know what your neighbor has done. So again, you might know more about what your own family has done uh, than you do your neighbor. Does that make sense? Right, but the, it does, but the people at the next table, I don't know what they've done. Right, but you're not within, um, uh, you know, you're supposed to be six feet apart from them. You're not walking side by side uh, with them uh, for any extended period of time. Um, okay, what about ski areas? Do you expect um, any, any change in the rules for how ski areas operate and attract people up from other states? Yeah, well, again, and the travel policy, yeah. The travel policy in itself is going to, to restrict many at this point, right today. Uh, but uh, thankfully, in some respects, we don't have any snow today. Um, we're going to have to monitor the situation. And, you know, I can't predict uh, where we're going to be in another month, month and a half. Uh, but my hope is uh, that uh, if we take the steps we're talking about today, uh, that we mitigate uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, that we'll work our way through this over the next month, month and a half, and that there will be brighter days ahead. And maybe at that point, uh, things will look much better and uh, we can have the conversation about ski areas at that point. Is there also a possibility that you might end up uh, making some other decisions like with salons or gyms, which are also businesses that you closed in March? Yeah, again, we've learned a lot about the virus and where it's spreading. That's why I said this is really based on, this is data driven. Uh, and we looked uh, at strategically at where are we seeing the outbreaks today? What is it that we're seeing uh, that, uh, uh, that was the root of the cause, uh, so to speak? Um, and uh, that's why we're, we're taking the steps we are today uh, to, to have a, a positive impact on the, on the spread so that it doesn't spread any further. So um, obviously all of those are on the table, uh, but this, at this point in time, we're just not seeing the spread as a result of some of the hair salons uh, and barbershops. That's not where it's happening. And what about gyms? Uh, we're not seeing it uh, in any great, to, to any great extent there either. Anything that we've seen thus far, I believe, has been the result of somebody bringing it in from another 
uh, another outbreak, but they've shut down and, and, uh, and taken care of it. So we're not seeing uh, the spread uh, there either. Mr. Sherling has one more point to add on restaurants. Just one more quick question. Is there anything that the state could have done differently so that we wouldn't end up in this at this point? Um, well, again, you know, playing Monday morning quarterback, uh, it's pretty easy to go back and maybe see something, but I, I can't, nothing comes to mind. We've been reacting accordingly uh, all along the way. Uh, the rise in cases has come quickly. And when you see uh, New Hampshire, for instance, had over 300 cases yesterday. Um, and we had averaging 25 cases last week. So we, we tried to do what we could in terms of uh, Halloween parties. I'm sure uh, you reported it maybe in your, um, at uh, BT Digger, maybe you had a story about not participating in Halloween parties and so forth. We were very specific about that about two or three weeks ago. Unfortunately, not, every, not everybody either read your article or heard us. Um, so as a result of that, we saw uh, a break, uh, an outbreak. So again, it's people letting their guard down, uh, not adhering uh, to some of the guidance that we're, uh, we're uh, putting forward. And, um, and now we're, we're experiencing the results of that. So again, if you can help us out, get the message out, you know, kind of suck it up for a while, um, dig deep, uh, we'll get through this. Uh, but, uh, but we're asking you to, to socially separate at this point, not just physically separate, socially separate uh, to get through this uh, latest uptick. Uh, Commissioner um, Sherling wanted to add something to the uh, restaurant guidance, I believe. Yeah, thanks, Governor. I think uh, you covered uh, uh, a piece of it there at the end, but uh, I was just going to add that the data does not show that if you go as a single household to a restaurant that there's a risk as long as that restaurant's following the rest of the guidance. Uh, and I would add uh, as an addendum to the answer on anything that could have been done differently. Uh, I think what we saw was a pivot from large, wide-scale compliance with guidance to um, unfortunately some hesitancy and, and some missteps. So if the guidance had been here too, our numbers would not look like this right now. Uh, is there any possibility, especially with things like the contact tracers, since it's been acknowledged that people don't seem to always cooperate with those, is there any possibility of penalties to bring people into compliance with this guidance? Uh, if that's for me, uh, again, we're just beginning a, a, a short duration process to uh, do compliance assessments, but as the governor's indicated, nothing's off the table depending on what our evolving experience looks like. Okay, thanks so much. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. <clears throat> Governor, do the new restrictions apply to this weekend's scheduled religious services? No, it doesn't. Okay. Good to hear. Uh, a, a question perhaps for the doctor. Um, are these new restrictions at all prompted by your concern about hospitals' reduced efficiency due to having to cope with the cyber attack? Is there a connection there? <clears throat> No, thanks for that question. The answer is absolutely not. Um, the hospital is functioning uh, very efficiently as much as they can. Um, all the hospitals in that system are continuing to deliver quality care to people. Um, it's our concern about hospitals in general, just like we had in March, not letting the number of cases gets so high that the capacity of the healthcare system itself is challenged. But again, we laid out today our three priorities. Keep people at work, keep kids in school, and keep people safe from severe illness. So reducing the number of hospitalizations and the number of um, deaths potentially by reducing the number of cases through human behavior change. Those are all priorities that I would dare say they stand on equal footing. 
It's not that we were concerned that one healthcare system had challenges due to a cyber attack and we had to do all this. Nothing could be farther from the truth and it wasn't even mentioned in all of our deliberations over many days. Thank you. Olivia, WCAX. Hello, I have a question for Dr. Levine and Secretary French. So obviously there are more outbreaks. People are being told not to gather in quarantine if they go out of state, but it seems many people think if they visit extended family for the holidays, be it in state or out of state, that they're safe because it's just their family. So will there be a mandate for schools to move to a remote method after Thanksgiving? either for a few weeks or even through the winter holidays, just as a precaution? Uh, this is Secretary French. Um, no, currently we are not planning such a preemptive decision, uh, but we'll certainly monitor the trends and the data. Um, but we don't think a preemptive decision like that's in the best interest of students right now. But would it make it easier for teachers? That way they can plan remote classes and not have to balance both those learning remotely and in person? Well, I think as you know, the, the theme of the press conference today, we're hoping uh, and expecting that educators in particular will follow the travel guidance and not travel out of state precisely so we can protect the opportunities for in-person instruction. Okay. And then also, in the beginning of the press conference, Governor Scott said that schools can stay open, but meetings that can be held virtually should be done that way. So I guess the big question is, what will it take to move back into a remote phase for schools? Yeah, I mean, the, the issue of meetings is something we've been encouraging all, all along, but it's just something that needs to be emphasized now more so than ever. Um, you know, we, we uh, probably haven't been as strong in our messaging. Uh, there's a lot of meetings that occur as a part of administering schools. Uh, particularly if people have been back inside their buildings. Um, we, we just want to make sure that even when they're in the buildings that they're taking advantage of any remote technology to uh, hold administrative meetings. Uh, but the issue of remote, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the broader indicators uh, that, are, that are going on. I think, you know, to make the point, uh, the lesson we've learned from the spring, per se, is that uh, we, we're going after sort of the root cause of this, which is the group gatherings right now. Um, everything we're seeing indicates that schools are operating very safely. Uh, so as long as we can continue to do that, um, we're, we're going to seek to protect that and then try to, on a sort of a surgical basis, go after uh, the cause of the increase in cases. All right. Thank you. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Okay, we'll move to Austin, the Burlington Free Press. Hi there. Uh, thanks for sticking this out with us uh, so deep into today's session. Um, I, I think my first question is for uh, Governor Scott or Dr. Levine, and it's I know there's some families out there that have formed pods for either remote teaching purposes to share resources. Uh, and I was hoping you could educate folks, maybe explain if you differentiate between a pod and a household and why, like if you know these families have created a pod, do they now have to break up that pod because they live in different, different physical homes? You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not as familiar with what a pod represents. Uh, Dr. Levine might be able to answer that. But a pod goes along the theme of a trusted household. And I would dare say that it's hard to be a trusted household in an environment where the virus is more prevalent in your community. It has nothing to do with being the best of friends being the people you would trust with your life at any other time in you know, your existence. Uh, it just has to do with the reality of the virus prevalence in our communities. So that makes it very, very challenging. Um, I do understand the concept, uh, but even potted households, they're restricting their social interactions in other ways. 
I understand that. But they still have other lives that they live apart from the household that they're parted with. Whether that's in their own work life, in their spouse's work life, in their kids' work life, etc. Um, so it's very, very challenging to um, recreate that at this kind of time. Uh, just the reality of the data that we have. Okay, and I guess the, the second question here is a little less direct, and um, I've been trying to work through where I'm um, work through some, some things mentally, but the the restrictions of the last week that you guys have unveiled have left me wondering, like, what specifically about the until now acceptable protocols, like maintaining distance, masking, staying outside, are suddenly you know, less effective in, in, you know, tamping down transmission of the virus. Like, if you're to walk along a road, you know, with, a, you know, a friend or a, a parent on opposite sides of a dirt road, you know, one of the back roads, you know, a nice fall walk, how is that suddenly less, you know, effective at avoiding transmission? Yeah, no, I, I get where you're coming from. The, the whole thesis for what we're talking about, though, is there are certain environments that are more structured, and we've talked about those through the last several questions, but the small gatherings of people tend to be unstructured, tend to not follow any specific guidance, go beyond distancing and masking because they're usually in circumstances of food and drink, and that does not allow people to abide by the kind of guidance they might abide by in any, any other circumstance in their life. Um, and these are prevalent enough that they're worthy of uh, comment today and policy changes that you've heard. It's as simple as that. And though I didn't want to recite the 100 plus outbreaks and situations we're dealing with, every single one of them resonates around that theme for the most part, 70 plus percent. So we're just doing what we need to do based on what we know. Uh, but to carry your question further, I do not want Vermonters saying, I guess this means I don't need to wear a mask or stay distanced from someone because it didn't work. That's far from true. It's very effective. It works. But when your inhibitions are down or your social circumstances mandate avoiding those pieces of guidance because you're eating and drinking with others, that's when things happen. That's all I can say. Is it fair to consider this perhaps, uh, like, if folks are, folks can be comfortable with their actions as strict as they can take them? Like, I mean, if, if you know you're gonna stay, you know, 10 to 12, 15 feet away from someone, that you need to talk to, want to see in some form, and you're going to stay masked, and you're strict with that with yourself. I mean, can you be confident in doing that? I think that's just taking our usual guidance and being confident that the usual guidance will hold you in good stead. So I would say yes. Um, you're taking your solo walk, and you may encounter another person. Um, and you'll clearly want to be on the opposite side of the street and having your mask on at that time too. Just like if you were on a trail climbing a mountain um, and somebody was coming down, you would have to react to that. So again, do all of the things you've always have done, but in addition, the crowds and here the small gatherings are what we're talking about uh, that's completely got to be considered every time you act. Thank you so much. All right, we have one questioner, uh, Steve from NEK TV, but it is 104 Steve, so please keep it short. Hello. Go ahead, Steve. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, I was wondering about keeping it short, and uh, I see that one outlet had four uh, uh, four questioners, um, four others had two questioners, but I guess that's neither here nor there. 
Uh, governor, uh, one for the governor and one for the doctor, if I may. Um, governor, on your uh, executive order about the new uh, the policing stuff, um, you said that you uh, uh, actively engage with communities, particularly those communities that have been historically marginalized or harmed by policing as we develop and deploy the best policing practices. Um, it, as you know, since 1937, uh, marijuana and hashish were wrongly classified as a narcotic. And, uh, you know, uh, it, every August, our state police would gleefully go up with uh, the National Guard and helicopters and uh, arrest people for growing outdoors. And uh, I've seen people who now have police records for, for having stuff as simple as, you know, a, a, an empty pipe. Um, will, will be, are these people considered marginalized and will, will they be included in, in, this, um, in, in this new panel and um, get input? Um, yeah, I, I have no idea, Steve. Um, well, are they, would you consider them to be marginalized or harmed by these policing practices? Well, maybe of the last few decades before any current times, but I, I just don't, I wouldn't even know how to answer that. Uh, if I may, Governor, it's a, an opportunity to say that uh, all Vermonters uh, of all communities are uh, certainly encouraged to participate in this process. If you go to our website, bps.vermont.gov forward slash modernization, you can review some existing drafts of new work and there are feedback tools available for all Vermonters there. Oh, thanks, Commissioner Sherling. That's, uh, it's very reassuring. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, would you consider these people to be marginalized or harmed by former policing practices? Uh, I don't exactly know how to answer that question. I'd need to, to contemplate a little further and know a little bit more. Steve, can we move to, oh, do you say you had a question for Dr. Levine? Yes, uh, Dr. Levine, um, we, uh, we keep referring to uh, the PCR method as a test. And um, I've been reading up on uh, the inventor of this method, uh, uh, Dr. Terry banks Mullis, and um, uh, from what I can see, it's, uh, he was actually quoted as saying that the, it's not to be used as a diagnostic tool and that PCR was uh, expressly not approved for diagnostic purposes and it says so on the leaflets and it's simply incapable of diagnosing any disease and it does not mean that an infection is present. Isn't uh, the PCR method more of an amplification method rather than a testing procedure? Yeah, so um, without getting uh, too into the weeds with regard to how we assay a specimen from somebody's uh, nasal passages, there are several steps that have to occur. There's a amplification process. Well, first of all, there's an extraction process the extraction process extracts the viral nucleic acid. The second part yes. is the amplification, which is so you can try to measure that in the assay that you're performing. So it's a two-part uh, affair, if you will. Uh, the simplest answer to your question, so people don't come away too confused, is that the procedure is used to be exquisitely sensitive at finding particles of the virus's nucleic acid, the viral RNA. So it does just that, and the person you noted, uh, wonderful invention, wonderful methodology. The intent of the comments that you were quoting, I believe, is consonant with what I've said at other times, which is just because you detect something doesn't mean that person is actively infected. And the way we've learned that is in this pandemic, there are people who get tested, are symptomatic, have an infection, resolve the infection, and you go back three months later and test them again, and they're positive. And it causes all kinds of trouble in their lives and in everybody else's lives as to what does that mean. And what the scientific community believes now is that means that there's still some residual viral RNA that's detectable 
in that person. Probably fragments, almost certainly not uh, viable in terms of being able to infect someone. So for us to call that person infected with COVID-19 would be a problem. So that's what you're driving at, is not every time you find the virus are you finding a person who's actively infected. But the flip side of that is there are people who have no symptoms, who have a very high load of virus, and we would hate to use that logic on them because those people are acutely infected and capable of infecting others, even though they don't have any symptoms at the time. So it has to do with how do we define a disease in all the clinical circumstances surrounding it and then integrate what the test showed into our decision making. So let's leave it at that so we won't complicate life for everybody too much, but you raise a very valid point. Thank you. Oh, great. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you all very much, as always. I appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in. And uh, for those going out uh, hunting this weekend, uh, make sure you uh, be safe and good luck. <laughs>